Only saints go to heaven. When I pastored in the most uh, Roman Catholic state in the Union, in the United States, the highest percentage of the population of the Roman Catholic is not Maryland, named after Mary, you know, Mary's land, but it's Rhode Island. They have the highest percentile uh, per capita of the uh, Roman Catholic kids. So when I pastored there, every Sunday people would shake my hand and say, thank you, Father, thank you, Father, because they all were born-again Roman Catholics, and that was ingrained. What I said back to them is, Thank you, St. Frank. They would look like I hit them. Kind of like, you know, Will Smith, you know, hitting that other guy. They would just go like that, you know, because they felt that was, that was almost blasphemous because they had been taught a saint had to go through this canonization process and the Pope had to decide. And that really made them listen. I remember I taught on how you become a saint. And boy, it was a full service. And I said, and I gave the gospel, and I said, even some of the most raucous, struggling believers in the New Testament church in Corinth, Paul wrote them their first letter and said to the saints at Corinth. And so it was a tremendous uh, witnessing tool. Okay, here we go. Yesterday we left off, and I'm going to finish yesterday, and then I'll pray and we'll start today. But yesterday, what is the Mass? And what I uh, point you to there is Hebrews 9. And if you don't have this marked, this is, this is one of the key passages in all the Bible that helps you witnessing to the 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in this world. Most of them will say that they have a disagreement somewhere with the church, but rarely will a born-again Roman Catholic, that's nearly an oxymoron, they are maybe a born-again Catholic, they couldn't really be a born-again Roman Catholic, because the Roman part is the pagan part. All of purgatory is from paganism. The beads are from paganism. The vestments are from paganism. The Pope's hat is from paganism. The orders of the monks are from paganism. Lent, as I shared with you yesterday, all 40 days of it is from paganism, celebrating you know, the, the whole rebirth of Tammuz that we talked about yesterday. But the worst thing, among all bad things, the worst thing about Romanism is the Mass. And here's what the Bible says. Verse 25 uh, of Hebrews 9. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. This is talking about Jesus dying on the cross. He would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is it appointed for men to die once, so there's no reincarnation, uh, but after this the judgment, verse 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear the second time apart from sin. Wow. The biblical view of the sacrifice of the Mass, the very heart of Roman Catholicism, is a denial of the completed work of the cross. That's what the Mass is. They offer Christ over and over again on the altar of the Mass. They are, what they call it is a bloodless sacrifice. And, and there are just reams of theology about that that they have written. It's the, the greatest error of all. Verse 28 of, of uh, Hebrews 9 does away with Romanism. Christ is not to be offered again once an hour in the big cathedrals. That's how often they do it in the big ones. Not once a day in all the other ones. Not all day long at those chapels surrounding St. Peter's Cathedral, the largest Roman Catholic church in the world. No. Jesus has already been offered once on the cross for all eternity. So uh, the danger of the Mass. By the way, Matthew 7, Jesus explains that each person's life on earth is, is very uh, black and white. You know, it's binary. That's a term nowadays, binary. People are very binary. You know, like, like uh, there are only two choices. Well, there are. There are two roads, two trees, two relationships, two destinies. Jesus described them. The wide road is the gate of religion. And if you follow the wide road of religion, the destination you're headed toward is death. You'll be surrounded by many, Jesus said. You trust in your own achievement that you're trying hard, you're going to do better, you have done something, you gave something or did something or whatever. By the way, the, the, the achievement little portion is a part of every world religion. Everybody tries to do their best. 
Uh, we were born following this old way. This is how Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to our own way. We're all born wanting our own way, not God's. And by the way, you have to do nothing to get to hell. You just float along. And then you have to pay in full for all your sins. So the lesson is, for the wide way, do nothing, go with the flow, end up thrown in the lake of fire, as we'll see uh, in our next hour. Christ said, no, the narrow road, the gate of salvation. By the way, he told religious people this. He told the Jews. You couldn't be more religious than them. They read their Bible all the time. They tied 10% of everything plus a whole lot more. Uh, they, they said all the right words. They intoned them. They, they came to the temple and everything. And he looked at him and he said, no, you have to be born again. You aren't in this because you're in the right family. You're not in this because your parents circumcised you or dedicated you or modern terms baptized you. To get in the narrow road, the gate of salvation, it's wanting the destination of life. And if you get on that road, you're surrounded by a few. And you're resting in divine accomplishment. That means that the Lord did it. Jesus paid it all. And salvation is by grace through faith, not by your works. It's only by God's revelation. In other words, it's... So then faith comes by hearing, Paul said in chapter 10 of the book of Romans, and hearing by the word of God. Peter put it this way, you receive the engrafted word. Uh, James said very similarly that we receive the word of God that is transplanted by God into our very beings. So we must be born again to follow this uh, new way. We must believe and repent to get here. And it's very interesting how much, as you saw all the way through Revelation 16 yesterday, God kept saying the only way out of this disaster you're headed to is to repent, to turn toward Christ. You must believe that my sins are paid for in full by Christ. So you listen to God's word, you believe, you call on the name of the Lord, you repent, and by faith you get forever forgiven and secure. So what happens when you do that? Well, one of the big places that happened is in Acts 19, 19 and 20. And it was in Ephesus, and Paul preached, and they, they turned from their Satan worship and all that, we covered that last week, all that they were doing. Well, I got to inherit a ministry in Rhode Island following a pastor who had led hundreds of Roman Catholics to the Lord. And after he discipled them, I think it was there a decade, he finally realized that there was a resistance in the church to going forward. So one Sunday they came to church and right in front of the pulpit was a 55-gallon drum. You kind of see those big round ones, you know, like trash cans in parks, and uh, they have a lid on them or whatever. They're, they're a 55-gallon drum, steel drum. He brought one of those and put it right in front of the, the pulpit. He preached on Acts 19, 19 and 20, which basically said also many of those who practice magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value. It totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, verse 20 when they got rid of all this wickedness, the word of the Lord grew mighty and prevailed. And you know what he told him? He said, some of you have your rosary beads and some of you have your little crucifixes. And he said, some of you have your little Mary statues and some of you have Saint so-and-so on your dashboard. And others of you have all these pictures and you revere them and all this stuff. He said, God's work is being held back because you don't get rid of that stuff because that all is a part of your not being sure Jesus did enough, and you've got to keep contributing. And so he just had this very important service and challenged him and actually dismissed them, kind of like last hour you got out two minutes early. He dismissed them, like, really early. And he said, I want you to go home right now and get all that stuff, and it goes in this barrel. Go, and I expect every one of you back. I mean, they were absolutely shocked, and they left. And they started coming back, and with tears and everything else, they... They threw all that stuff, and, and a lot of more than just, you know, Roman Catholic hardware went in there. Other people who weren't even Roman Catholic, you know, threw in a few of their DVDs and, you know, other stuff that they had. That church exploded. They planted, by the time I got there, they had planted 17 other churches in the Rhode Island area. Rhode Island? That is a barren wasteland for churches, uh, you know, back then. And these 17 churches were flourishing. They were in Brown University. They were in URI. They were all over Providence, all over the outlying. And, and the first church that was planted grew larger than the mother church. It got to 500. The second church was planted, grew almost the same size as the mother church. And, and that pastor 
really believes that it's what the Lord said. God wants us to destroy any personal reminders of Satan's lies so he can mightily bless our lives and ministries. Now, you might ask me this. You say, wait a minute. Where does it say in the Bible that any of those statues of the saints or anything else are wrong? Well, I want you to use everything you've learned in Word of Life, uh, everything you've learned in systematic theology, uh, you know, all the classes you've been through. Think about this. When you go to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, they have all the saints there. And you actually can go right down the line. They have every one of the saints that tells what they do. And if you have a son who's a soldier, you can get in front of the one that guards soldiers. If you have uh, someone that goes on the, the seas, you have one that guards them. There's the one, Christopher, I think it is, that people put in their cars. And you can actually get in a little prayer place and get on your knees in front of a St. Christopher or whatever and ask St. Christopher to help someone. Stop. Think about this. I said, where? St. Patrick's in New York City. So St. Christopher at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, St. Christopher, who is a saint, so he's in heaven, can hear you and can know where your son or daughter or whoever you're praying for know exactly where they are. On top of that, he can help them. Do you know what those three things I just described are? Omniscience, omnipresence, right? And we can go right down the line. They're attributing Roman Catholicism, attributes to Mary and the saints, the attributes that are God's alone. So I guess second, after, dis, after declaring that Christ's work on the cross was not sufficient and you have to add to it through the Mass, the second most deadly part of this religion that Satan spawned through the merging of the first century church with all the paganism of Rome. Basically, Constantine, to win the war, to become the emperor, painted crosses on the shields of his legionnaires, wrote in hoc signe vince, and when he won the war, he merged the church with all of Rome's official religions. And that's where the robes and vestments and candles and beads and all of that stuff merged together. And that's how the Roman church merged with the Catholic church. So it's amazing. And the 55-gallon drum reminds us that God loves consecration. How it all ends is the scripture. One element of that is, do you understand why God is going to burn everything up? He said that. Let's see why. We're right there in the tribulation events. And we bumped into these two chapters that are very unusual. Chapter 17 and 18. 17 is Babylon, the great harlot's lies. That was what I just finished. It's this, this apostate church. It has the framework of Christianity and everything's been merged in. And by the time we get to the tribulation, they've merged in everything. I really believe by the tribulation time that, that there is going to be an amalgam of Shintoism and Buddhism and Islamism and Christianity and Baha'i and everything else, you know, the, the JWs and the Mormons and everybody is going to find some commonality. And that's the great harlot. Uh, just as you see right now, do you know what's going on in Russia? Is the Greek, ortho, I mean, the Russian Orthodox Church is totally supporting Putin and his invasion. You see the merging. That, that's what the, the beast with the seven heads and ten horns. Always Satan's political desires have ridden on the backs of the religious conquest. And that's the Crusades, everything else that you know about that are so bad in, in history. But chapter 18 is Babylon, the great city's idols. And now we get into the other one of Satan's dangerous uh, lieutenants. The first one is religion. The second one is materialism. The kings, the merchants those that trade by sea. Now, we saw yesterday religion. Revelation 18 is materialism. Uh, what I defined it yesterday is the God of this world has two viruses he has been infecting all of humanity with since the dawn of human, the human race. Religion gets many, and they just try their hardest to achieve whatever God they want, whether it's the true and living God or their local God, through their achievement. And they, they work on making their own way to God. You find people all the time, they, uh, if you're a regular witnesser, you'll find all these people have designed their own ways to God. And they tell me, well, you know, I have a little this, I have a little that, I, I, and, and it's called syncretism. Syncretism is when you blend together many different, you know, 
religious syncretism is when you blend together elements of all the religions and you kind of make your own kind of hybrid, you know, your own special way to God, your own way to God. That's religion. You can do that within the church. I've met so many people that over the 40 years I pastored, I'd, I'd say, well, tell me, you know, they're having some crisis. Tell me about how you met the Lord. Oh, I did that. I, I went forward. I prayed. I went, good. What's happened since? What do you mean? I said, what's happened since? Have you grown? Are you hungry for the word? Do you hate sin? And what I found is, in the Old Testament, God mandated circumcision People thought they were saved by surgery. And so if they got surgery, not even they did it, someone did it to them, their parents authorized it, they were in. Do you remember how much Jesus struggled with that? With all the, They said, we're circumcised. You're of the devil. We have had surgery. We're going to heaven. That was the first huge error among religious people, among God's religious people. They thought... If you got circumcised, you went to heaven, and God says, no, you don't. Do you know what the second one was? The very, as soon as John the Baptist started baptizing people, and Jesus said, go into all the world and, and baptize born-again people, all of a sudden, baptism became like circumcision. And if you were baptized, you were going to heaven. When I pastored, uh, in, especially when I was in the Southwest, and all these people had grown up, you know, uh, Church of Christ or whatever, they would take me to show their baptism certificate because I would visit. Bonnie and I had a 100 home ministry, we called it. As pastor and wife, we went our first two months or three months, we would visit in 100 homes and have either lunch or dinner or breakfast with the family. We scheduled it. Our, you know, It's kind of like the president has his first 100 days. We had our first 100 homes. And I would always, Bonnie and I would share testimony. Our children that came with us shared their testimonies if they were old enough to talk. And then we'd say, and how about you? You know what most people did? They'd take me down and show me their baptism certificate. Or show me their, you know, their parents, uh, you know, when they were a baby baptism. And I'd say, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. So that's a great confirmation your parents wanted you to go the right direction. I said, when did you get saved? Wow. I went so far once as to have everybody prepare their testimony and And one Sunday, I had everybody stand up, and I said, you each have 30 seconds. Prepare a 30-second testimony. You each have 30 seconds. It's one minute. Turn to someone and read to them your testimony. Unbelievable response. So many people went to the elders, and they said, if he ever does that again, we'll never come back to this church. That, That is not what you do in church. You don't make people talk about how they got saved. That is not the purpose of church. And I thought, well, thankfully, the elders knew it was, and we had a backdoor revival because so many of those people didn't have a testimony. In fact, after that event, we started, I started going through Mark Your Bibles with the Roman Road and, you know, and got everybody ready for soul winning, and more and more people started being transformed. And so we had a summer outdoor uh, picnic after the first service, And we had a baptism, and the very first Sunday we did that, 150 people stood in line to be baptized because they had been saved since their parents baptized them as a baby. The next month, we had another one. We had another 150. We had about 400 of the 1,200 people in the church who were declaring that they had come to Christ because they had been counting on their baptism. So the first error of Satan was uh, circumcisional salvation. The second one is baptism salvation. You know, if you've been baptized, you're saved. Do you know what happened with Charles Grandison Finney in the 1830s? He started this thing of coming forward. And he just said, hey, come forward here. And you know what people started saying? I'm saved. I went forward. Did you know salvation is never about what I did? Salvation is completely in the Bible about what God did. Now, I respond. Paul said, Jesus knocked me off the horse on the way to Damascus, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I responded, but God paid the price. God convicted me of sin. God worked in my heart. I responded. And that also answers a lot of you ask questions. You're all concerned about going out on, um, on your... Uh, you guys, the first year go out on all this? 
uh, missions project or just the second year people? You do. You don't. You do. And uh, some have said you're concerned, you're scared about witnessing. I said, you know what is so exciting? When you share the gospel, God is more excited about it than you are, and he is working inside of them. And that's how you know how far to go as you share. If they are not a sinner, you don't keep going. Because if he hasn't yet convicted them, remember what it says in John 16? And when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not in me, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You know all that from John 16. If he's, he, the Spirit of God, is not knocking on the door and convicting them and making them feel miserable, we shouldn't go on. Materialism is the other deadly agent. Thinking pleasure, possessions, and power are more important than God. You can do that actively by living your life for everything, or you can do it passively, just going along with the flow. We talked about that yesterday. So that takes us to chapter 18. And chapter 18 is the warning about the deadliness of idolatry, making a good thing the ultimate thing. And God teaches us in Revelation 18 that there's life beyond money. Life is more important than possessions. You can't take it with you. Life is not linear. There'll always be unexpected, devastating changes and disasters. And there are no disappointments for the Christian, only the appointments of God. Those are kind of the devotional topics of the book of Revelation. Let's just go through uh, Revelation 18. And uh, let me get to it with you. And just look, these are just what I jotted in my notes when I was doing the devotional study like you're doing. I wrote my, my chapter title was live for what's eternal. And this is what I wrote. In a single moment, on a single day all over the world, the food supply will end, the transportation system will stop, the banking system will freeze, all luxuries, all hoarded wealth in every country will become worthless, communications will stop, no music, no TV, no cell phone, no Wi-Fi, no lights. That's what chapter 18 is about. God actually, boom. You know, a lot of people 22 years ago thought that was going to happen in Y2K. A lot of Christians, and they just, what they did is, instead of getting ready the way Revelation says, they got ready by hoarding and moving out away from civilization. No, no. The 18th chapter of Revelation gives us a roadmap for the coming economic collapse of the world. But God gives lessons that we can see. Do you remember what it says in Matthew 6, 24? That's the last thing on that slide. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon, materialism, earthly treasures, possessions, pleasures. Why? Jesus condemns it. That's what the first three verses are about. Revelation 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Remember, we already talked about no New Testament angel is Christ, okay? He doesn't show up in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there are Christophanies, Theophanies, angels of the Lord, not in the New Testament. So always know it's someone other than Jesus, even though, like I said, angels exceed anything we're even able to comprehend. This angel is lighting up the earth. That's an amazingly powerful creature, but it's not Christ. Um, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen, has become a dwelling place of demons. This is very negative. A prison for every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hated bird. What it says is, when you get involved in Satan's infection, which is materialism, you've got demons helping you. Or tempting you, if you're a believer, shooting fiery darts. And so... Jesus condemns worldliness. The first lesson is worldly possessions can't buy spiritual life, but they can buy spiritual death. Remember, Jesus talked more about money than any other topic. And he talked about money, and basically he said, money is the monitor of your heart. Not how much you have, how much you want it. It's the monitor of your heart. And this scene in in Revelation 18 depicts Matthew 16, 26. That might be what the loud voice of verse 2 is. Booming across the earth as the world is collapsing is Christ's warning. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for their soul? A lot of people will give everything and exchange their soul for stuff. 
So what does Jesus do? Look at verse 4. He calls. Now, you say Jesus. The angel's speaking, but this book is the word of God. So this is literally the message Christ wanted his church to hear. Do you remember that map I keep showing you of Asia Minor and those seven churches? Those people read this, and they got it. And it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues. What the Lord is saying is, don't get sucked in to the materialism of this world. And there are seven elements of the worldly system that Jesus will bring an end to. They start in verse 21. But let me read to you uh, James 4.4. 4. Because remember, there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. And it's just hearkening back. And look what James 4.4 4 says. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Next verse. Do you think the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealously? The spirit who dwells in us? This is talking to Christians. Verse 5 says, Christians can be adulterers and adulteresses. What does that mean? It means we are engaged to Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be living, not laying up our treasures on earth, but in heaven. But all of a sudden, we've been lured away because Jesus isn't as clear as this suitor is, which is Satan saying, why don't you, instead of laying up your treasures in heaven, live for me for a little while? And Jesus said, you're not being faithful, engaged to me. You are listening to my enemy. Well, what are the seven elements of worldliness? They start in verse 21. So look at chapter 18, verse 21. And the angel took a stone, a great millstone, and threw down the Babylon, the city, will be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. What? Verse 22. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, trumpeters, shall not be heard anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found. Do you remember what, what covetousness, materialism, what it is? It's making a good thing the ultimate thing that we live for. See, what God says is that, that we're supposed to, to eat in order to live. You know, we eat our daily bread so we can live another day. But most people live to eat. See, they're, they're backward. Remember what Paul called it? Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They mind earthly things. That's Philippians 3.3. 3. But he said, you're not like that. Okay, what, what happens? Well, in verse 21, a worldly person's identity is found in the world, not in heaven. It's this stuff. Secondly, they find escape through amusements. Do you know what amusement means? M-U-S-E, muse, means to think deeply. You muse on the news. You know, you muse on whatever. It's, it's an old English word for meditation. Ah the letter A, is called the alpha privative. You put an A in front of stuff, and it means not whatever you put it in front of. That was just the little way that they built words when, when they were communicating and when our language was, uh, was created and developed. And that ah, muse, means not thinking. People like amusements because they don't want to think. It's too hard to think or there's too much pressure, or I'm depressed, or whatever it is. So a person finds escape through amusements, doing something to make me not think. Entertainment, something that pulls me away into that. And pleasure-seeking, that's the list at the beginning of verse 22. The end of verse 22, worldly people use work, their success and career, even daily life, as a way out of spiritual responsibilities. They say, no, no, I, I can't, you know, husbands say, I, I can't lead the family in prayer and reading, but I have to go to work. But wait a minute, let's examine this. You have to go to work. Wait a minute. If you weren't so set on getting a bigger and better and more comfortable and more showy house, if you actually, instead of always trying to move upward materially, if you just got content, remember I told you about Wesley, when he started out in ministry, he earned 10 pounds a year, and he lived on one pound and gave away, or lived on one and a half and gave away eight and a half, and when he got to 100, he was living on 15 pounds and giving away 85, and when at the end of his life he had written hundreds, thousands of hymns and was very globally famous, he earned 1,000 pounds a year, and he lived on 150 and gave away 850. Do you notice that he never, he didn't let his income keep going up 
and, and raise his expenses to go with them. He capped off his expenses at a certain point. I had a good friend uh, that was an elder in one of the churches I served, and his grandmother left him a farm in Oklahoma. Nice grandma. The largest oil drilling company in, in Oklahoma asked him if they could drill, and the first pipe they poked in the ground was the single largest wellhead pressure gas well they'd found in Oklahoma. And he started earning that day 50000 a month. And he came to me and said, and no one knew this, and he came to me and he says, I'm serving the Lord here at the church. And, and he said, I said, oh, I know you really well. You're, you're a good friend. He said, well, let's go out to lunch. I want to talk. He said, my family and I have decided we're going to live on $5,000 a month. He says, that's what we lived on with my job. And he said, I earned $60,000 a year. He's a successful businessman. But he says, what I want to talk to you about, I said, yes. He says, I'm now earning 50000 a month. So that means I have... 50000 extra a month because I'm not going to spend it on me. What should I spend it on? Now, is that normal? No. What would most people do? 50000 a month. Man, I can buy a gated, you know, multi-million dollar mansion on the water and fill it with boats and quit my job. He never quit his job and he never bought. He still lives in this little house living on five. I think he still lives on 5000 a month. And he gives away the rest. You see, a worldly person uses work, career, sex, success, even daily life as a way out of spiritual responsibilities to invest in heaven. A worldly person is tied to technology and the knowledge of this world. They're up on everything. I mean, they know everything going on technologically and they're really involved in it, but you start talking to them about spiritual things, heavenly things, and it kind of gets fuzzy because they're, they're tied I mean, you talk about technology, and they just, <gasps> woo! You know, I mean, they, iOS, whatever, just came out. Did you see the WWDC? And I mean, they're the, the newest version of this, and they can tell you about their gaming, or their, their computer, or their music, or their, their newest beats, whatever. But you talk about the Lord, and they kind of, you know, they're tired, or they feel a little... I'm, I'm over bored explaining this, but you get the idea. What excites you? If it's God, you're not worldly. If it's not God, you are worldly. A worldly person is tied to finances. They measure people by wealth and possessions, and that's their goal, and all their goals are financial. Did you know God says that a godly person's goals are not all financial? Yet you talk to everybody, and their goal is they're going to get a good job. Well, they've got to get a good education to get a good job, and they're going to have a good 401 whatever, and they're going to save, and they're going to invest, and they're going to flip homes, and they're going to, of course, get crypto and the boom, boom, boom. And I hear when they're telling me that, that voice, Matthew 16, 26, what does it profit if you gain the whole world? They're tied to that. They're intoxicated by the world. That's what makes them happy. So Jesus shows us the end of worldliness. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 11, this is what Peter said, since all these things around you will be dissolved, what kind of people should you be in holy conduct? Since everything you see, even this beautiful campus, is going to be dissolved, we should be living for something other than what can be dissolved. The question the Lord asks is, are we worldly people? Is our identity here? Do we escape through amusements? Do we try and escape spiritual responsibilities? Are we tied to our social life? Because Satan's always tempting us to love what God hates. What does God hate? 1 John 2, 15 to 17, love not the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Satan wants us to chase our body's pleasures. That's the lust of the flesh. Satan wants us to chase the lust of our eyes, stuff. Status through possessions, through clothes, through whatever. The pride of life, chasing status. Do you know, social media has made so many people to be focused on impressing others. And, and if you ever, Bonnie and I were, you know, we were teaching our little small group uh, that we were teaching in Greece. We were up on the Acropolis, you know, the Parthenon and all that. While I was trying to do my lesson, the students gradually all started snickering because all these people would come up and the sun was just right like this and the Parthenon was behind them and they would have their photographer and they'd be going. 
yeah, all the poses they do, and then they'd get back to normal. And they had to for their posting that shot. And then they went back. They would always run back to see who took the picture, and they'd go, do them over. A lot of the ladies didn't like the way their husbands took I mean, their husband didn't take a good enough picture of them, and they would make him retake and retake. What, what is going on there? Are they trying to show the history of classical Greece and talk about, you know, the wonders of Western civilization? Or are they trying to frame themselves? Um, they're chasing status. Okay, that's chapter 18. Chapter 19. The end of human history. That's what the return of Christ is. Uh, might even involve, you know, some of those hailstones would be a byproduct of thermonuclear war. But all that doesn't matter. What does matter is what the Lord wrote us. And the first thing is, look at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 19. This is the run-up to the second coming of Christ. After these things are a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. This is before the second coming. Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. Look at verse 3. Alleluia, verse 4. Amen, alleluia. Wow, look at verse 6. Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Wow. This is the same word in the Old Testament, hallelujah. 144 times in the Bible. In verse 1 to 6, we have four of them. The most concentrated pattern of them uh, in the New Testament. It's actually an imperative, meaning praise God. And what is being praised is Christ's salvation. That's what they say in verse 1. His coming judgment, verses 2 and 3, the worship of Christ, 4 and 5, and that he's the sovereign, conquering king of the universe. And so, notice what they say in 4 to 6. It's a reaffirmation, if you remember that very first week we were together, I showed you that God wants to frame all of our problems in that little box by his, remember, he loves us, He's powerful enough to keep anything out of the box, his attributes. He knows what's coming before we do it, and he's with us, and I showed you that. They're, they're doing the same thing. They're saying uh, that they say, hallelujah, praise our God, and look at verse 6. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. Nothing's coming into my life that he doesn't allow, and he is actively working it together for good, and I just need to trust him. Now look at verse 7. I, this is what gets very exciting. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. I personally believe that this is the launch of the thousand-year meal. And the thousand-year meal is going to happen right after the second coming of Christ because it's the millennium. And the millennium, I mean, have you ever wondered what we're going to be doing? Well, it says that Jesus said that we're going to help him, and that the, the 12 apostles are sitting on the thrones, and Paul said that believers were going to be judging uh, people in, in the future. They were going to be like judges, appointed judges. You know, our whole Supreme Court, we just confirmed the new one. Well, we're going to be on God's supreme, you know, judging and, and working on the earth. But this is what I wrote. The church plus the Old Testament saints are all going to gather for a meal, and it might last all the thousand years. Do you know what Jesus said? In Matthew 8, 11, when Jesus was sharing the gospel with the Jewish people in chapter 8 of Matthew, he said, many are going to come and sit down at the table. In other words, a lot of people through the gospel are going to get saved. He compared getting saved and going to heaven to going to a banquet. But he said, when they get saved and they get to heaven and they sit down at the banquet, they're going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what he said? When we get saved, we join all the saints. You know, sometimes we're only thinking about the church. Have you ever thought about the way God lays out heaven? The gates and the foundations merge together, the apostles and the 12 tribes. Heaven is when God puts all saints together. And it's not like one group of saints are better than the other group of saints or whatever. Many will come from the east and west. Many will sit down, Jesus said, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I wrote this. Are you getting ready for the ultimate banquet? 
The greatest party is coming. The King of Kings is preparing a wedding feast like none other. It's the most breathtaking location imaginable. The greatest names of all time will be present and seated. At dinner, the invited guest will be rubbing shoulders with Adam and his lovely wife, Eve. One of the twin sons, Abel, will be sitting with them, as well as Seth and his wife. Not too far away will be the amazing preacher, the earliest known prophet, Enoch. The great-grandson of Noah, his family will be nearby. On down the long table will be the likes of Job and his clan. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, their family members. What a reunion. Moses and Elijah are walking around talking to the guests and visiting with old friends. And there's Jeremiah sitting in rapt attention with Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel. They're pointing out all the stuff they saw in their prophecies that's about the banquet hall. But what we're going to wear is in the text. Now look at this. Look at verse 8. Then to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. You ever notice that verse? Right now, by your choices, to either say no to sin and say yes to Christ or not, is determining what you're going to wear. That is, should be sobering. Our progressive, this is what I wrote in my devotional notes, our progressive sanctification will be seen forever. Revelation 19.8, we wear our good works for eternity, what we did for Christ and the power of the Spirit for the glory of God. So it really does matter how we live. And then after all that, we get to wear our outfits of our life as we follow Christ, that's what happens next. The ultimate triumphal entry. Jesus rides out on a white horse as the ultimate conqueror. And what does he do? This is verses 17 to 21. And it says that the angel standing in the sun cried with a loud voice, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Did you know that if you don't, if you don't come to the gospel invitation, which is that banquet I was just talking about, you become bird food. That's what happens to everybody else. They get eaten by the carrion, by the vultures, by all that. That's what happens. In fact, um, Armageddon is the destruction of hard-hearted humanity gathered against God. Wow. Think about what this says. In 14 to 21, most of us never think of Jesus as vengeful. So I pulled out for you Zechariah 14. Zechariah gives us a little detail that most people haven't read. This is what happens when Jesus shows up riding that horse. And thus it shall be the plague with which the Lord strikes the people who fought against Jerusalem. See, he doesn't stop at Armageddon. He's headed to Jerusalem. He's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. And as he's coming down, look what Zechariah says to all these armies and all the rebels and everybody that's against him. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. Their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Woo. This is not the rapture. That's the left-hand column. This is the second coming. No transformation. The saints are not going to heaven. They're coming back. The saints are not standing before the Lord. The earth is being judged. And it follows all the predicted events. And what is predicted is that we get to heaven and either we have gold and silver and precious stones and we get to keep what we did and wear it forever and offer our worship to the Lord, or it's ashes. Our life was good for nothing, time burned, doing stuff that wasn't sin, it was just worthless. Or all of our sins are gone.